Okay. Good afternoon. It is a great pleasure for me to be chairman of this last plenary lecture. In such a way, I will possibly to introduce my friend Luigi Preziosi. Luigi is full professor at the Polytechnico di Milano of Mathematical Physics. He studied yeah. mathematics in Napoli and he took two PhD, one in Minneapolis with, uh, as a, he had as advisor, also fluid, fluid dynamicist, Dan Joseph, and then another <coughs> PhD in mathematics in Naples with uh, Salvatore Rionero. He, then he moved in Turin, where he took the main activity of him. Uh, Luigi is um, a pioneer in, in the field of uh, mathematical model of uh, biological for biological application. In particular, it's a well-known uh, result of him uh, concerning tumor growth. He, uh, his activity is uh, in several books, maybe six or more, <laughs> and more than 100, 100 papers. He takes uh, many awards, in particular, just a month ago, he was elected a member of our National Academy of the in the section of mechanics and application of mathematics. As we know, the Academy of the is considered the most oldest academia, and the other the most important member, Galileo Galilei. <laughs> Therefore, I think today the talk is an overview of modeling frameworks child migration. Please. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for the introduction, very nice introduction. Thanks for uh, inviting me here. It's a pleasure for me. It's the first time in South America, actually. Uh, and uh, this is essentially the title says what I would like to do. Uh, and not only that, I mean, what I would like to do is to take a topic, a biological uh, topic that, in, in, according to me, is important application and in the near future will have uh, some important developments and to show you how this cannot be handled by uh, a single mathematical model and a single expertise, but we need a lot of expertise in order to face the problem, understand it, and do progress in, the, in these things. And in addition to that, it can bring uh, several uh, interesting problems from the mathematical point of view. So uh, before I, I uh, go to the mathematics, let me just mention what we are uh, essentially going to handle that. Uh, this is a cell uh, or an ensemble of cells and the environment they live in, uh, which is full of water, essentially physiological fluid, and this uh, network of uh, fibers uh, that probably you, you, know, uh, you, know, or, uh, you know something on, uh, especially women. Uh, because these are collagen fibers, elastins, uh, protoglycans, and so on. And uh, uh, so in this structure, fiber structure is relevant to hold the tissue and is also important for the cells because uh, it is used by the cell to move. I mean, the cells don't swim apart from uh, spermatozoa, but they use this structure in order to crawl. They grab them like a, a climber more or less, okay? So, uh, and the interaction that the cell have with this structure is, uh, is very relevant. It's important draw, uh, consequences on basic, uh, basic physiological uh, things that regards proliferation, apoptosis, which is death of the cell, and migration. This is an example, this is a picture just. Just a picture. Uh, these are some cells that are grown in vitro. And uh, in certain environment, they build acini. Acini is the, is the structure in the breast where milk is done, okay? And by themselves, they form this structure. But if the uh, environment is not proper, and in, by not proper, I mean here that uh, it's stiffer than normal, then you have a non-functional organ, what is called hyperplastic. You have more cell than expected. Uh, this is still physiological, uh, but if you increase furthermore, then you have a transition 
from what is called a physiological situation to a pathological situation and the formation of metastasis. We are not thinking here of some genetic changes of the cell, but just is the same type of cells that are put in different environment and they behave differently according to interaction that they have with the environment, okay? And these are pictures, okay? Real picture of the experiments done in, uh, in 2D collagen, and you see what I just showed. In the sense that you see in the central part, then there is this uh, hyperplastic, uh, hyperplastic situation, uh, but this is still benign in the sense that there is a membrane here, it's all constrained, it's not functional, but it's good. But at the end, increasing the stiffness of the substratum of this collagen, then the cell acquire this motility phenotype and they spread all around and invade the tissue, invade the collagen, okay? So this is from the, say, negative point of view, disease point of view, but uh, the same kind of, say, interaction is also important if you want to build an artificial tissue. In the sense that if you want to use a, a stem cells in order to build some, some uh, I don't know, uh, patches to repair from heart failure, from strokes, then you take the stem cells, you have to culture them in proper environment with given stiffness, and according to the stiffness that, that the environment uh, the, the mechanical properties of the environment, then the same cell can become a neuron or a bone cell or a muscle cell or whatever. You can understand that this has relevant consequences for, for building uh, artificial tissues, for building, for, from, for recovering from uh, uh, strokes, as I said, but also for injuries of the, of the brain. Parkinson, um, dementia, or Alzheimer, or even, say, to try to build bridges for those injuries that have, uh, are the causes of many people that have to, uh, uh, say, walk, actually walk, to move with the wheelchairs. What is the problem there? The problem is that uh, when you have an injury, you have a scar, okay? This is well known for, for wounds in the, on the skin, but this is also uh, occurs at the inside of, the, of our body, and the scar have different mechanical properties regarding to the physiological one. So if one tries to inject some stem, cell, stem cells uh, on a spinal cord, they will not become neurons. They will become uh, skeletal muscles or other kind of cells. Though the important thing is to understand how this thing work and how, um, say, one can do something in this in this uh, topic. So the first thing to understand then is uh, how the cell interact with the with this extracellular matrix, how they exert traction forces on it, uh, and then of, uh, how they react to the environment. And, and this is where, for instance, the first point where mathematics comes in, okay? So let me state what is the classical problem in, uh, in continuum mechanics, in elasticity. Typically what you do is that you give a force, a stress, and then you say, okay, I have these stresses uh, that is acting on my body, and I want to find my deformation through some models of, say, linear elasticity, viscous elasticity, plasticity, and so on. So you have an operator acting on the deformation and gives the force. Actually, you give the force and you have to find the deformation. Okay, this is the, a, a direct problem, okay? Now we want to do something different here because what we have uh, in, uh, available is instead the motion of the, of the cell, uh, not the cell, uh, the motion, I don't know if you see that. Then let's try the other one. Uh, you see the deformation of the environment of the extracellular matrix, you are not able, you cannot put, say, a dynamometer or any instrument that can measure how the cell is exerting on that, and you want to infer that. You want to have this information, okay? So at the end, what you have to do is the reverse. I mean, you have the deformation and you want to uh, find the force. So this is an inverse problem, okay? It's an inverse problem that in some sense looks, looks trivial. Because if you have the deformation, you apply your operator A, you find the force. So what's the big deal? Well, the problem is that 
you don't have the, this information on the deformation everywhere. You have the, the information of some points because, for instance, you pour some beads in the, in the, in the madrigel and you are able to, say, uh, monitor how these beads uh, move. Or uh, you have this network of fibers and you can track how the fibers are moving. Okay, so you have only the form a partial information. Uh, luckily, what you know is that if you are in two dimension, in two dimensions, the cell can exert forces below the cell, of course. Okay, um, and then you want to understand where are the, ex the forces exerted and how strong they are. Okay, so at the end of the story, what you have to do uh, is the following: among all the forces that the cell can exert. Uh, you have to find out uh, the one that in, in some sense give as a consequence the deformation that is closest to the one that uh, the, you are uh, measuring. Of course, there is some experimental error there too to, be, to take into account. So this is what uh, is stated mathematically. You have a set uh, of solution with nerve resultant and momentum, set of forces, you have some measured deformations in some points. So you compute the deformation for any of this, uh, any force in this set. You uh, evaluate it uh, in, uh, in the measurement points so that you can make some distance. And you try to minimize this distance, but this is not enough. You uh, say take the smallest possible force that will generate, uh, that is able to generate uh, this deformation or a deformation close to that. Okay? Well, okay, you can play with it. You can minimize the function and so on. And you find out that uh, the problem in this case is a, a coupled problem for we use linear elasticity here and uh, you have uh, two uh, equations that looks like the one of linear elasticity and this can be solved. Okay? So this is a mathematical problem that is actually well known, well known since 10 years or something like that in the field of bio, uh, biomathematics and biology. Uh, the method is called traction force microscopy and has nothing to do with microscopy in the sense that the only microscope that you have is the microscope that takes the data from the gel to say what the deformation is. Okay? Then uh, after that everything is mathematical or if you want uh, numerical because you go to the computer, you solve the equation, and this gives as a result this one. I mean, you measure this, you measure the deformation of the beads, these points are the beads, and you infer and you solve and you see where the forces are exerting, are exerted below the cells, okay? And the picture here that you get is uh, that uh, forces are exerted, say, at the head and the tail of the cell, not in the middle, and they are directed toward the inside of the cell, okay? So as you see, and at the end of the story, if you go now to the biologists, they will never forget about that. Yeah, they have a tool, and like with magnetic resonance and so on, they forget all the mathematics that is below uh, what they get on the computer. And actually, you can do the same uh, also in a dynamic situation, because you can take a picture of a cell moving uh, like this one, these are some snapshots. Uh, you apply the method, and this is you can understand where the forces are exerted in any point and so on in any instant of time. Uh, okay, so this is one part of the story that is now very uh, well understood, uh, but it works in 2D. Most of the experiments, you have to know that on cell mechanics are done in 2D, while of course our body is 3D and cells move in three-dimensional structure. Uh, so the problem, the mathematical problem in 3D is a bit different. Okay, why? Well, because in 2D the measurements uh, are done everywhere, uh, and you know that the forces can be exerted below the cell, I mean in a domain, omega C. If you have a, instead a cell in 3D, uh, the measurements are outside the cell, not inside. The beads are outside the cell. 
So you have this uh, region with this domain with a hole. The measurements are in, the, in this domain with hole. And uh, forces are exerted on the boundary. So the problem is a bit different from something on inside the cell is something on the boundary. But I mean, the structure is the same. You can uh, play with the problem. You have the same functional. You can work with it and so on. And uh, this is what you get. I mean, this is uh, at the mo at, at present, I can show you only the results of some numerical experiments. So uh, on the top, you have uh, some forces uh, just that we made up. Uh, this uh, will uh, generate some deformation of ge the gel. And uh, then from that, giving that deformation as an input, you can recover, say, uh, with the inverse problem, uh, this, these forces. And uh, the final, at the end of the story, you have to compare this with this. And you see that the algorithm, at least in principle, works. Uh, what we are missing now, and there is some people that is working on that, is to get some real 3D data to uh, test what is the difference between the dynamics of a cell moving in, in, on 2D surfaces from the dynamics of the cell moving in 3D. OK, so this is one part of the story. But uh, and there is a second issue that is, uh, say, uh, ubiquitous in all the models that have to do uh, with uh, cell mechanics or even to biology. It, and it uh, has to do with the fact that uh, the models have to be intrinsically multi scale what I mean by that is that, uh, for instance, we, are, we have a model that told us something about how the traction forces behave inside the cell. But at the end of the story, what we want to do is to, say, insert that information. We need to insert that information in models that describe the behavior of the cell or the behavior of ensemble of cells, even billion or trillions of cells. OK? And uh, then what we have is then some mathematical models that deal with uh, the interaction of the cell with the outside world, with the environment, what is called interfacial modules in, uh, uh, in uh, biomathematics. And there are also some modules uh, that have to do with, uh, say, what happens inside the cell with all the reaction kinetics, uh, Alberto Bersani will give you a talk at the end uh, of the day today. And all the networks that are connecting all the chemicals that are inside the cells. This is a very uh, new problem that is coming out since uh, the, 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 the birth of, say, system biology. And these two, the interaction of these two, will give rise to some physical modules that are the end of the story, are those that gov are governing the overall behavior of the cells. From the mathematical point of view, then, there are some microscopic models, that models that work on the microscopic scales that have to be coupled with some models that uh, work at the say, level of the individual cell or uh, at, the level of, uh, at the continuum level. Why am I saying that? Because the second part of the story will try to build, say, this, this bridge. I mean, using some information at the microscopic scale of what we have learned uh, to the macroscopic scale. One of the things that we need uh, in the macroscopic scale, then, is the interaction force that the cell or the ensemble of cell is, um, is exerting with the substratum, OK? So it's an overall quantity. It's, we will be called here M. What is that? It essentially, it's the sum of all the microscopic forces, the traction forces, that the single addition bonds are forming with the substratum. In principle, we have to sum that up. Okay, we have to do an integral over the entire, say, uh, region below the cell, for instance, if we were thinking of, of one single cell. And this force depends on the age of the bond and on how this bond is stretched. Okay, if I stretch this addition molecule, then the more it is stretched, the more this uh, addition force is. And you have a lot of them. So the common idea is then, the, the possible idea, not the common, the possible idea is then to introduce a state variable, a distribution function uh, of the, say, essentially over the age of the, of the, of the bond, the age of the bond, so that uh, the total addition force 
is, uh, is the force, is the sum of the forces weighted over this distribution function. If you integrate over this distribution function, you just have the number of bonds that are active and so on. And at the end of the story, one has to find out, say, an evolution equation for this uh, distribution function. And that's it. We have then a structure, a, a, a structural uh, population, I mean, structural model because we have age. And this just tells you that uh, the, this distribution function with time ages becomes older and older. Uh, then it degrades, and because while uh, times goes by, some bonds are broken and new ones are formed. So the, the bonds that are broken are reflected in this term here, and the bonds that are formed, of course, start with H is equal to zero, uh, newborn baby, and so it's a boundary condition for this hyperbolic system. Okay? So, luckily, what happens is that these bonds renew very rapidly. So the time, the bond age is much smaller than the travel time, or if you want, the length that they can extend is much smaller than the size of the cell. And this allows you to work, to drop the stem derivative and to work in a quasi-stationary uh, situation. And you can actually integrate that. You can integrate this equation. And the reason why I'm doing that is that you can compute the distribution function in a quasi-stationary uh, situation. You can put that in the definition of the, uh, this uh, interaction force, this macroscopic parameter. And here you have a formula that tells you how these macroscopic parameters depend on quantities that are entirely microscopic. Okay? So this is one, from my point of view, an easy example of what is meant by saying that you have information at the microscopic level because this is what you get from the biological experiments and you want to infer something microscopic. Here you have, say, the, uh, the formation, the rate of formation of the bonds, the maximum number of addition, the focal addition points, I mean, the uh, number maximum of integrins, they're called, uh, the force that uh, the, the, the cell are able to exert, and, uh, say, the reason why the bonds break up. Okay? So you can use that. You go back to the experiments. You know that there are some experiments that tell you, say, what is the probability of breaking up a bond according to the force where, that you are exerting on the cell, that you are peeling up uh, the, 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 um, the cell, and this is the distribution function. You put that into the formula, and then what do you get? Okay? You have this, this behavior like this, which is reflected here, and then there is a, a branch here that is, not, is missing in this experiment. Okay, what does this tell you? It tells you the following. This is a, fu a function of the interaction force with respect to the relative velocity. Those who are uh, familiar with some uh, mathematical physics can uh, really understand that this is a phase transition diagram we'll, uh, we present, phase transition, and tells you the following. Okay, assume that the bunch of cell is, uh, say, subject to a certain force because it, they are growing and they are pushing the, the cells nearby, okay? And this is here. If the cells are strongly connected with the, with, the, with the collagen, with the substratum, so that their curve is this one, they will stay at rest. Because, you know, the interaction between the, uh, the interaction force is smaller than this threshold value here. Okay? But if you have some forces, uh, some forces, some cells, that are able to lower this, especially this point here, below the threshold value, then you have that for this force, the cell will move, okay, with this velocity here. So in principle, if you have a clone that is able to, say, have uh, bonds with the extracellular matrix, with, the, with this substratum, which is weaker, then they will be able to move with respect to the extracellular matrix and to, say, invade the tissue, okay? And they can be, this motion can be slow, it's called mesenchymal type motion, or can be fast, okay? And the phase transition is because, I mean, if you go beyond, beyond this point, then you jump over this upper branch here. 
And okay. This is one part of the story, but uh, there is another, another thing that is very important, especially in, uh, in cancer uh, modeling, and it's to do with the following fact. Most of the tissues, even the arsenide that I showed you before, are contained in membranes. Uh, tumors, this is a pancreas tumor, uh, they grow into membranes. The membrane is a region of thick uh, extracellular matrix. It's a net. It's a thick net. Okay? And the cell cannot go through this net. So as long as, um, even if you have a tumor and it's uh, containing this net, it's very easy to go open uh, the, the tissue and take out the, the stuff. But the fact is that at some point, the cell uh, acquire uh, a, a capability of loosening this network and invade the surrounding tissue. That's the, the mechanism by which you have invasion and then the, you have the formation of metastasis, okay? So the thing is the following. If you look at this picture, at this experiment, you see that uh, you have a cell that is trying to move but will not and is stuck there. Why? Because the cytoplasm, this uh, red stuff here, the part uh, around, say, the nucleus, is very soft, can extend 100 microns long, a cell is uh, 10 microns long, uh, but the nucleus is very stiff. So the nucleus, like behind, it cannot penetrate this network, uh, this fine network. Instead, this is a, a, a neutrophil, a white blood cell. The nucleus can deform a lot, and this can penetrate things, okay? This also explains why, for instance, the cells of the immune si systems can penetrate a lot through uh, the vessel wall, while, say, other cells cannot, for instance. Okay? So, from the mathematical point of view, which is, uh, what is missing is the role of the nucleus in this story. And this is, as I told you, it's important to understand, say, uh, the spread of metastasis. Uh, this is a measurement, and here what you have is that below a certain cross-section of this network of fibers, this network here of fibers, you don't have any motion, okay? This is the final point. How can I understand why there is this uh, uh, breakup here, this, this threshold value? And uh, what, is the, what are the, say, uh, the quantities that, uh, uh, say, inter, um, that, the, say, govern, say, this, this threshold value? Okay, so let's, let's start again with the picture. This is a biological picture. We try to schematize, to simplify it a bit so that our extracellular matrix, this network of fiber is just a, a set of microchannels with a certain size here. And so th this is the scheme of the cell. I mean, there is a nucleus lagging behind and there is the cytoplasm protruding inside the, the cell. And what we know from the point of view from previous, uh, from the initial of the talk, is that the cell try to, uh, say, connect with these walls here, exerting traction here in this apical region, okay? For instance, take it uh, uh, as a constant, but this doesn't really uh, change much if you take another function here. And this is trying to pull inside the microchannel this hard stuff the stiff nucleus. And you know that the stiff nucleus need to deform in order to penetrate this microchannel. So going back to some continuum mechanics, one of the criteria to get the penetration of this uh, heavy ball behind the cell is that the work done by destruction forces need to be larger than the uh, energy that is required to squeeze the nucleus inside the, the, this microchannel. This is the criterion. You can play with it, in the sense you can do some continuum mechanics and to understand, to evaluate these energies, and this is what you get. I mean, uh, this is a for, uh, take the ellipsoid one. Uh, if the nucleus deforms an as an ellipsoid, then the criterion tells you that this dimensionless number must be larger than this function here. This function is a function of what? It's a function of the ratio of the radius of the pore the radius of this, uh, the distance between the fibers, and uh, uh, the nucleus, the dimension of the nucleus, 
okay? How big is the pore with respect to the nucleus? Uh, and this uh, number here measure, say it's a ratio of quantities that are, uh, have to do with the traction forces. Uh, this is the force, this is the amount, say how many bonds are formed. Uh, in in uh, the denominator, there is the nucleus stiffness. So for instance, this number is small if the traction forces are small or if the nucleus stiffness is large, okay? In this criterion, graphically in the parameter plane, it's just this curve here. Uh, you see here the dashed line and the full line are the two criteria according to how the, the nucleus deforms. So there is not this much difference. And what the criteria tells you is that there is an area in this parameter plane uh, in which, I mean, uh, motion inside the, the, the microchannel is forbidden, completely forbidden. There is no way to get in. Which means that if you have a cell with a certain uh, mechanical characteristics, okay, uh, in order to pass through the, this network of fiber, the pore radius has to be large enough. You, it, it has to be larger than this value here. Okay, the channel has to be wide enough. Or if you have a, 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 an environment with a given, say, uh, given geometrical characteristics, then uh, the clone that will uh, be able to penetrate are the ones that have this number here large enough, which means, for instance, that the nucleus have, be small, have, be, have, be, uh, have to be uh, not so stiff or the forces have to be uh, large, okay? So this separates, in some sense, a clone that will stay, say, in the islet of Langeran, in the Asinai, and those that will move. Because uh, during the history, uh, the cell will undergo some genetic changes, and only those that acquire the, the uh, mesenchymal phenotype, is called, uh, this phenotype will escape and will give rise to metastasis. Okay, but this gives you only an information on, uh, uh, on the criterion. Does not tell you anything on, uh, say, how, what is the velocity of motion in the extracellular matrix or in microchannel. In order to do that, we have to, say, model the single cells. And there are uh, 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 many, say, uh, models that are uh, able to do that. Uh, I present here the cellular post model, which is the most, say, popular among biologists because what they see is what they see actually on the microscope. Uh, in this model, the, the space is discretized in, uh, regularly in square, hexagon, or whatever. Uh, the cell is represented by several nodes, and the crucial part is to define a sort of energy, a generalized energy, an Hamiltonian, uh, and evolution will tend to minimize this system energy. Okay? And there are several contributions to this energy. The most important one is the interfacial energy that tells you how the cells want to stick to each other, making, say, what is called cell-cell addition bonds. And then there is another one that is, in some sense, is taking care of, say, how expensive it is to have large cell or small cell than the target volume. Uh, and the other one is, has to do with external forces, something like chemotaxis, other things that I will not describe. So this is uh, uh, the, the game. This is the horse race. Uh, we have three channels. This is the cell, an individual cell. This channel is wider than the cell. This is wider than the nucleus, but uh, smaller than the cell. And this is smaller than the nucleus. You run it, and if the nucleus is stiff, what you get is that these two will pass, will penetrate and reach the other uh, end, but this one will not. Why? Because the nucleus cannot deform much, and so even if the, try, the cytoplasm try to uh, penetrate the microchannel, this will keep the cell uh, outside the microchannel, as you can see in this movie here. Okay? This is a cell that cannot exert a large traction on the wall of this microchannel, though, I mean, this is 10 microns, so it's large enough, and it will not go through. And if, you, if I continue I go on with the movie, you see that it's still there. 
Okay? No way. Instead, if in some sense the cell is able to loosen, to soften the nucleus, or to soften the membrane that is containing the DNA, um, then the, the nucleus will deform, okay? Like here you can see white the nucleus, and this will go through. Like, like in this cell here. This will be very fast. Uh, taking up the decision, let's go. You don't see here the nucleus, but it's deforming, and then swishing through. Now, at this point, we have a tool to evaluate what? To evaluate the speed of the cell inside the macro channel, to model that. And this is what we get. I mean, you have this biphasic behavior. It's called biphasic behavior or bimodal behavior, this maximum, that tells you that there is a maximum that preferred, say, pore size in order to have the, the highest speed. And this pore size, more or less, is uh, the same um, size of the nucleus, okay? So um, in order to have the highest speed, the cell have to be in channels like, say, more or less like this one, like this one with uh, a, a size that is not constraining, is not impeding, say, the motion of the cell, but for which the cell is very elongated and can exert a lot of traction. How can you use this information? Well, uh, actually, this is confirmed in a uh, network of fibers, not in macro channel. For instance, if you want to build a scaffold, an artificial, uh, uh, an artificial thing, gel, uh, in order to repair wounds, okay, uh, then the size of these messy fibers, these are artificial fibers, the size, the typical size, have to be of the size of the nucleus. Okay, in order, for instance, to put that in the, on the, uh, uh, over your skin and have the cell of the skin, fibroblast, keratocyte, populate as fast as possible your wound. Uh, and this is actually done. I mean, this is a, in, 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 a, a concept that is applied nowadays and can halve the days of uh, cure from injuries especially for burned people, and you have to understand that this is crucial because uh, people that have burns, they die because of uh, uh, loss of water, okay? So having the wound cured in half a, half a week rather than a week can save lives, for instance. Okay, but let's go back to the continuous model because at the end of the story, what we want to do is to use that for our continuous model. Uh, oh, it's this one. Okay, these are, uh, let's see, yeah, okay. This is a spheroid, it's called a spheroid. There are billions of cells here. No way to simulate that with, a, uh, with, a, uh, with an individual base model, okay? It will take centuries, probably. Uh, so we have, we have to use a continuous model, PD, whatever. And if you look at these experiments, you have the, the outside. These are not cells. These are just the protrusions of the cells. The nucleus are here. They will not be able to, to penetrate in this region here. And so we have to say, uh, to deduce a model that is able to do that. It is able to constrain this cell uh, into, into the extracellular matrix, okay? Without going into the details of the mathematical models, this is the, the addition the interaction force that I told you about. Uh, you can, uh, you know now that th this depends on the pore size, the nucleus elasticity, the fiber elasticity, and so on. Uh, you can model that looking at the experiment in the following way. And the crucial point here is that you have the positive part of this, of this square parenthesis. It tells you that if the size, essentially what we said before, if the size of your network is not enough, this is zero. There is zero velocity, okay? And now, from the mathematical point of view, you can understand that if you plug in this VC into here, you have an equation that changes type from hyperbolic to parabolic, 
becoming also degenerate, not uh, parabolic, uh, according to whether, according to the regions where the cells is moving together with the extracellular matrix, or they are moving with respect to the extracellular matrix. Okay, uh, so this is a non-trivial problem. I, I'm, from my point of view, also from from the uh, analytical, from the study of the analytical properties of the of the system. And and now you know that this A0, this uh, crucial say, threshold area, threshold uh, dimension, depends on a bunch of things that are all geometrical in some sense and have to be evaluated, okay, for, for, for any, for any, for any uh, thing, and some of them for any uh, structure, and some of them are mechanical, okay? And this is what you get from the simulation. This is just a simulation. You have a, uh, a membrane here, you don't see the normal cell here. I didn't uh, show them up. I didn't know how to do that. These are just a bunch of cells that are, it's a clone that is growing, say if you want a tumor tissue, in a, in a normal tissue. This is the membrane, but if they are not, uh, the nucleus is not so soft, they just reach this membrane and will stay there, here. But if the nucleus is soft, then we'll just go through this net and invade the outside of the, uh, the outside world. I mean, they get, will invade the tissue, okay? And this is not able to be done with other, with other type of model, without taking into account the role of the nucleus. And you can see the same here. I mean, this is just a vertical section of this one. I mean, this, you have the red clone, which is the, the tumor size. When it reaches the membrane, it will penetrate and will go to outside in this case. In this one, it will not. Uh, okay. But now, uh, and then you can play, of course, with this in a in heterogeneous environment. This is still, I mean, the difference here is that there are regions that are, say, thicker with a finer net and regions that are uh, softer, uh, softer, uh, wi with a wider net. And those with a wider net can be penetrated, and those where the, there are thick membranes cannot be penetrated, and so on. When just one last, last thing, what happens if instead you want to, uh, to uh, describe, as in the movie that I showed before, an ensemble of metastases that move in a fibrous environment? Okay? Well, this is not a continuous. You cannot use a continuous, a, a, a PDE model or something like that. You have need to use some, some kinetic modeling, okay? And define, say, a distribution function for the cell with some velocities a distribution function of the fibers uh, with certain directions. And so uh, you have to write down, say, a, a, a transport equation for, the, for, for this population of cells. And the crucial point here is to understand how the cells behave when they collide, when they meet each other, and how they, uh, they say, uh, collide, as they behave when they meet, meet a fiber. Because when they meet a fiber, essentially what you have want to do, uh, the, the cell want to follow the fiber, okay? Now, the thing is here that luckily the cell doesn't have enough memory, okay? So in the collision, the collision is very slow, plastic if you want, so they just forget the velocity they had before colliding. This is a strong uh, simplification because at the end of the story you can simplify the collision kernel from a double integral to just a known function, very easy dumb function. And the same occurs when, the, when you deal with the collision with the fibers. Uh, again, you forget about the incoming velocity and you go either right or left. That's what they do, okay? Well, this is done, I mean, uh, uh, especially to understand, say, how metastasis move in the brain. Uh, the brain is a very anisotropic, uh, a tissue because there are neurons that goes from uh, one place to the other. You can uh, realize here these are the eyes and these are the tracts that the neural tracts that go to the back of the, of the, uh, of the brains where the visual part is, uh, is located. And there are uh, gray matter, white matter, the white matter is done by axons and so on. Uh, and the anisotropic, uh, anisotropic, uh, anisotropy of the tissue is measured by some tool that is called diffusion tensor imaging. You can do that. 
put that in, into the, your model, and this is the simulation of what you have for a growth of a tumor in a virtual isotropic environment, and here in a, say, a fully anisotropic environment, and this is needed from the patient, uh, for, for, for the doctor to understand the extent of where the tumor is in the brain, okay? Because uh, if you go to MRI, the MRI will only locate part of the tumor here and not the entire tumor because you need a certain mass in order to, uh, to know where the, uh, in order to, say, impress your, your, your instrument. But there are all cells that the doctor want to eliminate around, say, the, the white stuff that you see in uh, MRI of, or other tools. And I think that uh, this will, uh, is the end of it, and thanks for your attention.